Good morning, everyone, and welcome. My name is Davide De Biasio, and I'm a member of the ISQG Outreach Activity Team. Today, I have the pleasure of interviewing Professor Juan Maldacena. Thank you very much for being here, for having accepted our invitation. Yeah, sure, it's a pleasure. Thanks, thanks. So after having obtained his PhD in physics at Princeton University, he pursued, and please stop me and correct me if I'm wrong, but he pursued a postdoc at Rogers University and was later awarded with a professorship at Harvard. He moved back to Princeton in 2001 and is now professor of theoretical physics at the Institute for Advanced Studies. Thank you again, if I may. Was your career correct? Did I outline it uh, in the proper way? Yeah, yeah, that, that was great. Thank you. That's great. Well, being fully honest, your contributions to the fields of quantum gravity, holography, black holes, physics, string theory are pretty hard to wrap up in a quick introduction. Nonetheless, would you mind briefly summing up for us your main research interests? Well, I'm interested in uh, quantum aspects of black holes, in quantum gravity, um, maybe a bit about quantum cosmology. And, and in general in quantum field theory and, and gravity. Well, uh, among all these things, uh, uh, today I'd really like to exploit our interview uh, to discuss the broad topic of holography, right? Which is uh, perhaps as interested as generally misunderstood in some sense. It's really hard to get a complete and precise picture of the state of the field that developed a lot in recent years, right? So would you like to start by telling us what this idea of holography is, how it came to be in the first play, what led us to believe gravity might be holographic? Um, well, I guess the, the modern version of holography is that um, we, there are some space times that we can describe completely through some theory that lives on the boundary um, of those space times. So those are special space times that in some sense have a boundary, which we could explain later. The, the idea was inspired by black holes. So black holes have an entropy which is proportional to the area. Um, this is a curious formula and surprisingly interesting formula that was derived in the 70s uh, by Beck and Stein and then made more precise with the discovery of Hawking radiation. Um, so those, those formulas suggested that the black hole could be viewed as an ordinary quantum object that <laughs> obeyed the standard laws of thermodynamics. Mm -hmm. So that was a very spectacular realization. And then th this somehow led to the idea that uh, yeah, perhaps the black hole that's described from the outside can be described as an ordinary quantum object. Um, Hawking famously objected to this idea. Um, and so it was a kind of debate of uh, whether it was true or it wasn't true and so on. Um, and uh, then thinking more about the, um, the, the this Bekenstein formula, um, it was suggested that the Bekenstein uh, formula was an upper bound on the number of degrees of freedom or number of qubits that could be contained within a region. Mm -hmm. And um, this uh, then led to the idea, this is what at the time was called holography by Doft and Saskin. Um, now, uh, so the, the ADS-EFT somehow came from a different point of view. So it... Uh, it was based on the study of black holes and so-called D-brains. So D-brains are some objects in string theory yes. uh, that were discovered by Joe Polchinski. And they have the advantage of being somehow somewhat heavy objects, uh, which have a very precise uh, mathematical description and string theory description uh, that was found by Joe Polchinski. And, and, and they are on the verge of becoming black holes. So when you put many of them, they have properties similar to black holes. And, we were studying these properties in the in the mid nineties, and um, then so there were calculations you could do using the D brain picture, and they were given similar results to calculations done using gravity and black holes. And um, after trying to make sense of that, uh, came the idea of uh, well of the so called ADS EFT correspondence, which or, or gauge gravity duality, which is this idea that certain space times, certain 
um, have a, can be described by a theory that lives on the boundary. So this is best understood for the space times that have constant negative curvature. Um, so yeah, these are these are space times that can be viewed as a kind of gravitational potential well. So sure. Um, sure. they have a gravitational potential that grows as you go away from, let's say, let's call it the center. Um, though there isn't really a center because uh, of the translation symmetry. So. Uh, symmetries of the the, the, the space, um, but yeah, as you go, as you go away, uh, the gravitational potential grows. So any particle sort of that comes out, that goes out, will eventually come back to you, and so on. Um, and in some sense, you can think of a boundary that is very far away. So a sphere, very far away, uh, you can call that the boundary. Um, yes. And yes, pardon me. So if I pardon if I jump in, but yes, please. Our audience, uh, you know. Uh, diverse. Uh, let me allow me to uh, boil down what you said a bit and sum it up. And if you agree, okay, yeah. so we are uh, mentioning a lot of different concepts and and things, right? So, uh, first of all, you started from holography, from the observation that black holes have a an entropy which is uh, proportional to their horizon area, right? The famous formula by Bekenstein. And then you mentioned that this was interpreted as some kind of actual thermodynamical entropy, right? Counting the right. number of microstates of the black hole. I assume that claiming that the entropy of a black hole, that, that a black hole can be seen as some kind of quantum system with microstates is what is usually referred to as the central dogma of uh, black hole information. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's right. right. That's right. That, okay. Yeah, that, that idea is, is in Bekenstein's work. I mean, sure, sure, Bekenstein sure. was thinking about uh, the black hole, I mean, the entropy as a real entropy, you know, that's of, of a system, no. As an actual thermodynamic not, not as a, no, no, Not as an analogy, but as, as an actual entropy. Yes. Actually, the history of this is funny because uh, Hawking, Carter, and uh, I think Bardeen wrote a paper, well, outlining this, what, what now is called the black hole uh, thermodynamic formulas. Mm -hmm. um, but then they said explicitly that it, it did not make sense because the temperature of a black hole is zero. Um, and then a few months later, Hawking realized that the temperature is actually non-zero. <laughs> well, black holes... Uh, let, so let the, the black holes are very confusing. So it's... Uh, yeah, yeah, this is... Uh, and even, and even when you everyone take... Everyone who thought about black holes uh, was confused and uh, was somehow misled by some aspects. So. But this is reasonable, right? And there's still a lot to, to unpack. Yeah, there. we're still confused. Yeah. I mean, I'm, <laughs> I'm not confused. <laughs> well, uh, in this sense, uh, uh, black holes are weird for many, many reasons, but they share a lot of uh, uh, properties with uh, standard thermodynamical systems. So you have a set of laws, right, which resemble uh, thermodynamic laws. And then the hint came that they might be actual thermodynamical systems, not simply no. some objects with laws that resemble them. With, I mean, weird properties, we said that, but like, you know, as the more they radiate, the the more their temperature grows, at least in some very specific settings, and so on and so forth. So this is uh, this is fine. Then you mentioned the ADS-CFT correspondence, right? As a natural, you know, uh, would you call it a realization of the? Because because up to now we we stayed in some. Yeah, kind you could of, you could call it. Yeah. Uh, so the, 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 there is yeah. So let, let me just try to. To construct so so when you think about the black hole, so it's a localized object, and you say, well, where are these degrees of freedom? So you could say maybe they are on the on the horizon, or maybe a little bit away from the horizon. Um, so if you have a black hole in this spaces with constant negative curvature called anti-sitter space, so you could go further and further and further, and then you go really so far out that you include the, both the black hole and the whole universe. And it's for this case that we know what the actual degrees of freedom are. We, we have a, a, an explicit Hamiltonian. So what, what the, um, the ADS safety correspondence gives you is the explicit uh, well nature and dynamics of these degrees of freedom. But not for the isolated black hole, but for the black hole together with the whole universe around it, provided that universe is this universe with constant negative curvature. So... So that's what it gives you, and it also gives you the theory even when you don't have a black hole, but uh, that's how it's connected to black holes. But um, yeah, ideally, one might want to have some other theory which describes only the black hole without uh, the rest of the space. That we don't have yet. But, uh, mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much for clarifying this point, which is, I mean, 
pretty important, right? Then, because you, you really need to characterize the degrees of freedom corresponding to the whole universe. But we use this we we use this verb quite a few times, right? Correspondence, uh, duality, maybe. Uh, can you? Uh, once more, being our audience diverse, there might be undergraduate students, passionate people that might have never heard of this kind of dualities, correspondences. So, and once more, you might just think when you say that a gravity theory corresponds to a theory on the boundary of the space time we're describing, what do you really mean? What does this imply? Like, what's the physical meaning of this? How do, would you interpret right, something? Right. So the idea is that well, well, first of all, let me just talk about gravity and black holes. Yes. So in, in the gravity description, we uh, can indirectly calculate the entropy of the black hole using the first law of thermodynamics and so on. Um, but we we do not have a, an obvious description of the microstates. So what are the states, the quantum states that give rise to this entropy? <laughs> um, it is somewhat similar in spirit when you have we are describing a gas and you know the the you know the, the the relationship between the entropy of the gas and the energy and so on the specific heat but you don't know what the gas is made of so um, eventually it was understood that the gas was made of little molecules that were moving around and uh, and these molecules are responsible for giving this entropy a statistic the usual uh, statistical meaning um, so so historically, we went from the Carnot entropy, so the entropy just defined in terms of thermodynamics, to the entropy of Boltzmann defined uh, in terms of statistics of counting states. Um, so we gave some kind of our, microscopic interpretation to the notion. Yeah, that, yeah, right. that's right, that's right. So, so for that, we needed uh, a picture of uh, of what the mo what the molecules are. So you can, you can make the hypothesis that the entropy is counting something, mm -hmm. um, but in the case of gases, it was understood that what you was counting was the number of states in which the molecules uh, mm -hmm. could be arranged and them, so, could arrange themselves. So, um, so this is somewhat uh, similar in the sense that the theory at the boundary is analogous to the molecules that they are the ultimate description. Mm -hmm. uh, they are the description of the microscopic degrees of freedom that give rise to the entropy. The theory in the interior, at the very least, is similar to. Um, is similar to hydrodynamics or to some kind of uh, thermodynamic description. Mm -hmm. At least the theory outside the black hole looks like this. In gravity, the theory continues inside the black hole. So we think that gravity really has more information. It's a little more, it's more than just a thermodynamic approximation. And so we think that if we were to understand properly the theory of gravity, we would get the full description and that the two should be equivalent. So that there is some way of starting with the bulk theory and mm -hmm. systematically improve it by considering corrections, new topologies, etc. Mm -hmm. um, and after you take into account those corrections, then you would obtain something that, which is similar to what you get from the, from the from the boundary theory. So in that sense, uh, we talk about the duality in the sense that the the same system could have two alternative descriptions. So we could describe it in terms of interacting particles moving on the boundary or uh, some degrees of freedom that um that live in the bulk space time okay. so in that sense it's similar to let's say well at the vague level is similar to let's say particle wave duality which is yes. you know okay you, okay you, you can uh, have uh, something that you can view as a particle there is wave or or perhaps more precisely one would hope to have under an understanding of this which is like fourier transform let's say you have uh, a yes. signal which would be in 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 time or a signal which would be in Fourier space and you could translate between one and the other. So that's a case where you have two descriptions of the same signals, but they are, and, and we understand the map between the two. In the case of of um, ADS-EFT correspondence, we don't understand the map uh, in, okay. in, in an explicit way. Yeah. Okay. I mean, we understand some aspects of this map and we, we understood much more than was understood in the beginning, but... Uh, so uh, in this sense, just to boil it down once more, to sum it up, you have some kind of universe, right? Uh, let, let's make it explicit in D dimensions, which can be either four or five, whatever. The, the, then we'll get into that. Then this universe is a geometric object that's clearly a boundary, right? Or at infinite distance. I mean, whether this is applicable to any possible 
universe with any possible geometry you might think of is something which I'll ask you later, but uh, boundary clearly is one dimension less, right? Mm -hmm. Interior, right. right? This is clear. In the interior, you have a theory which is like general relativity, which you have gravity, perhaps quantum gravity, with a dynamical geometry and so on and so forth, you react exactly. to energy. Eh? And on the boundary, you have a theory without gravity, right? Exactly. That's, that's the cool point. And the yeah. two are equivalent in the sense that if you have a physical object, a physical system, you can either describe it in one or in the other equivalent. Yes. That's the, the main idea behind this, right? Yes, yes, that's the idea. Mm -hmm. Okay. And which is quite shocking, right? Let me stress this because those two theories live in the different dimensionalities. So uh, is it, uh, I mean, this is quite, quite hard to digest, right? Because a universe seems to be four dimensional, at least at our energies and so on and so forth. Well, this is quite hard to digest, isn't it? Uh, right, right, right. That's strange. And, and the, this fact that the the new there is a new dimension that's supposed to emerge, this radial direction. Um, well, it, it's not super well understood. I mean, it's uh, somewhat understood. There are various uh, qualitative things, mm -hmm. and uh, one can see it in some calculations, which okay. we can get later. Okay. Into. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's it's not as explicitly understood as let's say a Fourier transform or sure. some sure. very concrete uh, you know mathematics that you can go between one and the other. We we mostly can compute in both pictures and see that the answers match. Well, and concerning this, I mean, going back on track, uh, you mentioned brains, strings, object like that. So you were getting into the uh, the main content of your 1997 paper, more or less, right? Uh, the large and limit of superconformal field theories in, and supergravity and so on. Would you like to briefly sum up the content of that work, which is recognized more or less as the moral beginning right. of the research in ADS-CFT correspondence and all over and so on and so forth? Right, right. Yeah, so what, what that paper did was to, um, to somehow isolate a part of uh, the geometry mm -hmm. um, of this... Uh, Deep brains or black brains mm -hmm. uh, that had a simple description that had the description in terms of a simple gauge theory. Mm -hmm. um, and it did so by starting from the uh, D brain, the, the D brains in string theory. Um, and they had two two pictures for these D brains. One was the one that uh, Polchinski had, um, um, which at low energies reduces to a certain gauge theory with large number of supersymmetries. Mm -hmm. So a very special symmetric type of gauge theory. So similar to the theory that we describe for strong, in that we use for strong interactions. Mm -hmm. And um, that's one picture. And the other picture was uh, as a black brain. So it's a bit like a black hole or an extremal black hole. Mm -hmm. uh, and so there was a region of this geometry sort of deep down. Um, and that region of the geometry had the geometry of anti de Sitter space, so a space with constant negative curvature. Mm -hmm. And the idea was that that part was described by the gauge theory, just that part. Um, and uh, yeah, so that that was basically the idea. I was just taking a limit on the... Mm -hmm. uh, on the In the region. large end, right. In yes, the large yes. and this, this, this okay. is what the approximation becomes better when n, the number of brains or the number of colors of the gauge theory is very large. Okay, so uh, correct me if I'm wrong, the whole point lied on the fact that, well, in string theory, in general, let me let me put it this broadly, uh, we have some objects we refer to as brains. These brains are, you can imagine, imagine as higher dimensional objects, right, of various yeah. dimensions, either even odd, depending on what you do. And such objects allowed for two different interpretations, right? Either yeah, that's right. gravity yeah, sources, that's right or as places where some kind of particle physics theory, some kind of gauge theory is defined, right? Is this yeah, exactly, yeah. the starting point that then allowed you to- Yeah, that, that was the starting point, but, but but once you get to this relationship, you can forget about the brains and just think of the, the, the there are, yeah. Um, so that the brains were like a useful bridge to to get to this relation, were very, very crucial. Okay. And, uh, 
And most of the explicit examples that we have for this relationship use uh, these brains in some way or another. Um, okay. Yeah. So in that work, uh, the the kind of correspondence that was shown, I repeat this for who's listening to us, uh, was a correspondence between a gravity theory uh, in ADS times S5, right? ADS5 times, right. times S5. So five-dimensional anti-decita space-time with ne negative curvature product with a five-dimensional sphere, right? And a supersymmetric super young meals and equals four theory. So can you please describe a bit more in detail the two sides yeah, of yeah, this yeah. Yeah. Be so... Before describing the two sides, let me just uh, make one sort of more yeah. philosophical point. So sure. we started with this idea of the central dogma that black holes are described by some quantum system. Sure. But we don't know what the quantum system is. Mm -hmm. Now, the idea is that if you have these anti-decitor spaces, yes. they are described by uh, quantum theory on the boundary, which is a so-called scale invariant or more precisely conformal invariant mm -hmm. field theory. So it's a very special kind mm -hmm. of field theory. Mm -hmm. um, and that in principle should be true for any anti-decitor space. Um, now, if you have some more specific gravity theory and by more specific gravity theory, we mean, let's say, some way you have of define your favorite way you have of defining quantum gravity of which mm -hmm. we, we really only know the string theory cases but um but if you have such a theory then you have to say well i have some anti space then i have some internal dimensions and so on um and depending on the shape of the internal dimensions i will have uh, different theories on the boundary mm -hmm. and we understand these theories on the boundary for some cases, so not, not for arbitrary situations, mm -hmm. but for many, I mean, long lists of uh, infinite lists of uh, cases. Um, and so the one you mentioned is uh, one of the simplest and most studied cases where the internal space is also very symmetric. It's just mm -hmm. a sphere, five-dimensional sphere. And the theory of the boundary also has the, the, a large number of symmetries, yes. a kind yes. of symmetry, which is called supersymmetry, which is a in particular, a symmetry that makes the theory easier to analyze. Mm -hmm. That's why people like it, yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So in principle, we think it's true for for more general situations, um, but it, it's not. We we understand the examples sort of on a case by case situation, and with some arguments that depend on each case. We we don't have a general method for finding the boundary theory, given the bulk theory, or or, vice, or even vice versa. So. Okay, so it has to be worked out with a case-by-case -case approach, right? You have to right. look for some correspondent theory on the boundary and so on. And, and, and not, not all of them uh, are expected to give, a, not, not any boundary theory will give you a theory where it's well described by Einstein's theory. So okay. it, uh, it could be a, a theory where... Um, which is not well approximated by Einstein theory, it could be like a more exotic theory of gravity. Um, okay. So the, the cases that are described by Einstein theory are cases where the boundary in the boundary theory have very strong coupling. So you have somehow the possibility of making the particles on the boundary super strongly coupled. And it's in those cases. Okay. We have correspondence to Einstein theory. Well, and since we are moving, uh, I guess we're moving towards more modern results, right? Starting from that. Uh, 90s, uh, 90s paper, uh, and l let me frame it a bit in a more in a more broader sense. In a broader sense, um, where did we get to today? Like, which development developments follow that original works, and how much did we manage to push the boundary of our inquiry? Sorry for the choose. I mean, boundary in this sense, right. boundary of, right. of research, not of, of space time, right? Uh, so after that original correspondence in highly symmetric, highly, you know, after having shown using brains and string theory, heavily relying on string theory, right? The two the, the correspondence, what else did we get? Where did we get from that point on? Right, so, well, the, I think it went into several different directions. So, okay. um, one was understanding more, more examples, as I already mentioned. Um, another interesting direction was to understand even the original example. Um, so in the, in the this original example is a, is a gauge theory where it has a coupling constant that you can tune from weak to strong coupling. Mm -hmm. 
<laughs> and uh, when you're a strong coupling, you're supposed to have the gravity description. When you're a weak coupling, you're supposed to have a description of mainly just free free gluons. Um, okay. And in in that theory, people did computations um, where so so through some heroic efforts, the the it, it was understood how to solve the theory in the large n approximation and see how you go from weak to strong coupling. Mm -hmm. So basically you have that chains of gluons that have colors that are entangled uh, with, with, with their neighbors, um, sort of transform into strings that live in the bulk space-time, uh, in a big bulk space-time. So that's understood in complete uh, mathematical detail. Okay. Um, so if you wish, that's uh, fairly strong evidence for this original. Well, that's very strong evidence for this correspondence in the large n limit. Okay, where large n, pardon me, because uh, yeah. just to, to really, where this yeah, end we're mentioning is uh, clearly a number characterizing the number of degrees of freedom in a, uh, of different features or particles can have, like this is really for everyone colors in our gauge. Yeah, let me, let, me, let, me, let me explain it a little in more detail. So what, what N is. So the, the theory at the boundary is similar to the string theory of strong interactions, which contains right. a particle called gluon. And this gluon can have colors, yes. colors and anti-colors. So each gluon has somehow two indices. So when it's the color index, there's this anti-color index, and each of them can go from one to one. So in the theory of strong interaction, that goes from one to three. So there are three colors, and that's why they are called colors, the three primary colors that we see with our eyes. So <laughs> let me be clear, yes, colors have nothing to do with this. That's just a fancy yeah, name. Nothing to do with the color, it's just that the number is three. So that yes. <laughs> it's just a biological thing. I mean, yes. birds would not have called it color because they have four receptors or more than four <laughs> three receptors. <laughs> um Anyway, so we, for some historical reasons, we call yes. this uh, this number, and it's just the, the number of indices. So, um, and in the large and limit, the um, the this so this gluons strongly interact when when you have two gluons whose indices are entangled with each other. So it is as if uh, each gluon has two hands, and they can link them to the hand of the next person and which is the other gluon and that one, and they can form a closed chain. And so you have this closed chain of... Uh, if I may, uh, this, this from, from a more practical perspective, when we say that two systems are entangled, we mean that uh, they are described collectively by one quantum system and non separately as two independent quantum systems that can be watched, right? Just to, you know, make yes, it clear yes, yes. for everyone. Yeah, so, so, so what I mean is that, uh, so there is the color of one gluon. Yes. And it's uh, entangled with the anti-color of the next gluon. So I was representing this as one gluon giving a hand to the next one. Now, so they're not independent. They're in entangled sense. in this way, that's the free description. But then once we turn on the interactions, the two gluons whose colors are entangled will interact strongly. So they really give their hand and hold them very tightly to the next person. Okay. Um, and in this way, so if you think of each person as each gluon, right, they form some closed chain. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, you, you can have extra people joining into the chain and so on. So the gluons number is not conserved. But uh, um, yeah, and those those chains, when the, the coupling is very strong, so this handshake pulls them together in some, some way, they give rise to a string that lives in the bulk space time. And this is understood in, in essentially complete detail. So one hand on the boundary, we have a chain of gluons in the bulk, a corresponding object, because we said yeah. an object can be described, a system can be described either on the boundary or in the bulk. Yeah. So here one description is the chain of gluons, the other is a string living in one dimension yeah. more in the bulking side. Yeah. When we say yeah. bulk, we mean yeah. inside, right? Is this correct? Yeah. Okay. I, I should say, I should emphasize that the, the the fact that these theories that have color, like the theory of strong interactions, give rise to strings is something that is observed in nature. So in nature, um, when you collide the uh, strongly interacting particles, you produce uh, quarks that are joined by a string. <laughs> um, that, that strings are, are are it's made out of the gluons of nature. Uh, yeah, this is uh, this weirdly connects to the origin of string theory as an attempt to. Yeah, that's right. So historically, string theory was uh, started by trying to describe well the physics of the strong interaction. And, yes. Um, 
Right. And then then basically the QCD theory, so quantum chromodynamics, uh, was found as the correct theory. Yes. And as we said, with three colors. Still, yes. Yeah, the, the three colors and uh, these gluons and so on. But still, at low energies, these gluons become strongly interacting mm -hmm. and they give rise to the, the, the fact that color is confined. So it's, it's, it's only, so we only have color neutral objects and so on. Uh, but the strings then are explained now in terms of the gluons. Mm -hmm. And in a way that is somewhat understood, mainly through numerical simulations. Well, it's understood through numerical simulations, uh, not, not that well theoretically. Um, mm -hmm. And um, yeah, so so strings are real. I mean, they are seen in experiments. It's not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, uh... and so when you mean that we understand well this correspondence, we understand this correspondence between uh, uh, chains of gluons on the boundary and strings in the bulk well, does it mean that, the, are you referring to the case in which the number of colors goes to infinity or also yes, 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 which yes, is yes. really large, right? Like, yes, yes. should it be strictly sent to infinity in which things yes, get yes, way easier? I'm, I'm, I'm talking about the case when the number of colors is very large. So it's, okay. yeah, it's sent to infinity. In principle, there are corrections to this picture, which mm -hmm. are, yeah, one over n corrections. Um, and this will be related to the interactions of the strings in the bulk or to interactions between the bulk particles. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, uh, yeah, given that the free theory, well, given that we found this correspondence to the string theory, we think it's likely that the one over n perturbative series will also match. Um, and okay. in fact, some aspects of that were checked, but but not not completely. I think there is strong evidence to believe that in this simpler example, the whole series expansion in the bulk of uh, okay. string interactions and the one over n expansions will match. Okay, so uh, for for the audience, uh, what you're saying and correct me once more if I'm wrong is that we understand it pretty well. It's really solid when n is sent to infinity. Yeah. That means that we expect that when n is really large, there should be some corrections that go like yeah. 1 over n controlled by a factor, which is 1 over n, which, yeah. by the way, goes to 0 when n is sent to infinity. So this correction disappears, right, mm -hmm. as we send right. n to infinity. And it has been checked that such corrections correctly mm -hmm. match to each other in some at some order in some cases. So we expect that... This could really be some kind of correspondence even for finite n, right? Yeah. Well, for finite n, then then it goes beyond this perturbation series. Okay. And um, the, the, as in any sort of perturbative series in quantum field theory, string theory, this is an asymptotic series. So it, in principle, determining the function exactly is harder. And, um, and so it... Uh, I would say this not been checked non perturbatively. So, okay. um, or yeah, so then th those non perturbative aspects are harder because even the, the theory in the bulk is not, uh, we don't know how to define it non perturbatively. So, okay. we know how to define a string theory through perturbation theory, but not non perturbatively. Even and, uh, allow me just to quickly jump in to clarify one. Uh, one small point when we say that we understand something perturbatively we mean that there's some physical theory in which interactions between objects are weak right yeah so you can take the theory in which things do not interact and slightly modify it in order to have interactions yeah. when interactions are really strong we do, cannot use this perturbation methods in order, right? This is this is the kind of picture you have in mind when you... Yeah, yeah, that's right, that's right. So maybe people might have heard about these things called Feynman diagrams or diagrams of particles interacting in space-time. That's the perturbative description. So so when you use those those methods. So in uh, in the non-perturbative theory, we don't we don't have such diagrams. We have to understand it in some other way. It's really hard, right? Because particles really make sense in the perturbative regime and so on and so yes, forth. Yes, yes. Things get a bit... Uh... Yeah, so, so in quantum field theory, the non-perturbative description is in terms of some lattice model, which mm -hmm. then you take uh, the lattice space into zero. So that's how we... That's a full other way of defining theories, yes. Yes, so, yes. 
uh, you were saying that there were different developments uh, after the, these original papers, right? Various. Yes, yes. yes. Develop- so, so I covered one, one, one of them. Yes, yeah. exactly. Can we, maybe we we get back to yeah, the story? Yeah. Yeah. So then, then, then another thing was to uh, apply. So, so the theorem the boundary is strongly coupled, mm-hmm. and so, um, so if you believe the relationship, then it gives you a toy model for strongly coupled systems. It gives you some simple way to analyze a strongly coupled system because the bulk description is relatively simple to mm-hmm. study. So it, it translates a hard problem on the boundary theory to an easy problem in the bulk. Mm-hmm. And for this reason, it was also studied a lot. Um, so that that's in the field of, let's say, applied uh, uh, gauge gravity duality. Well, yeah, because as you said, like, let me... Pardon me, pardon me, pardon me if I jump in, but let me stress this, because as we said before, theories in which interactions are really weak are much easier to understand from a mathematical perspective. So you're saying that in this correspondence, one boundary bulk, one when is weakly coupled, the other is strongly yes, coupled, yeah, yeah. and vice versa, right? Yeah, yeah, that's right. So the idea is that the so the theory that involves strongly interacting particles in the bulk in the boundary. Mm-hmm. translates into some simple let's say gravity theory in the bulk yes. okay and perfect. Then you can yeah uh, and for this reason it was studied to model problems in nuclear physics condensed matter physics and various other topics um, um okay so that that was another set of developments and it led to some interesting things like the discovery of uh, certain uh, effects in new effects in hydrodynamics when you have theories with funny symmetries and uh, and this was understood first using these methods and then it was understood in general just uh, which is a nice check right for the methods yeah 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 well it, it it's uh, this shows that having a toy model that you can solve is useful for understanding general things it can make you think about well perhaps a more general argument so that's a success story um then another thing that was uh, that i think was very well that was also very influential was um a generalization of the bekenstein formula which is started by some work uh, by ru and takayanagi mm-hmm. um, so it's a it's a formula for computing the phonon and entropy of a quantum system on the boundary so um uh, th- this this is somehow slightly different than the thermodynamic entropy. Um, so the, um, the, the the yeah, let me see how to. So the the, the von Neumann entropy is really the, um, the the entropy that you actually have in the full exact quantum description. Uh, so um, and the the thermodynamic entropy is an entropy that arises because of coarse graining because you. Mm-hmm. Don't, you only measure a subset of observables. You don't measure all the possible observables. Um, so, so in no, systems in thermal equilibrium, yeah. If you have a system that is in thermal equilibrium and, and you let it equilibrate for a long time, the two are equal. So normally, for most people, when they learn thermodynamics, they don't learn of this as uh, different concepts. In, in fact, uh, for most physicists, it's news that the two are different. And and this is important for when you consider uh, dynamical processes. So okay. if you um if you have uh for example a, 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 a small box within a bigger box that is empty and the small box contains some gas and then you open the little box it will fill the bigger box <laughs> and in this process the von neumann entropy or microscopic entropy does not change because the number of states did not change when you did this uh, but the thermodynamic entropy will rise so this we would call it an irreversible process where the thermodynamic entropy rises um Okay. Now, okay. Um, and in general, we don't have, I mean, if you're given a system, it's, it's hard to find a formula for the von Neumann entropy. You, you have to know how you made it or, yeah. Um, so you really have now, to know the microscopic description for the system to get yeah, the- Naively, you have entropy. to know the microscopic description or you have to know the history and some assumptions about the dynamics. Let's say if it's a unitary dynamics and in the past it was, in a small box, then the entropy had to be small. It would be have okay. to be yeah, it's smaller. Um, now, this is relevant for black holes because you could imagine, for example, a star that collapses into a black hole. Mm-hmm. So, 
uh, the star might have some entropy, but that entropy is much smaller than the entropy of the black final black hole that will will result from the collapse of the star. Um, and so, so through the process of star collapse, the the Bekenstein entropy increases. Before it was so the, the entropy was just the star entropy, and then it's the area of the horizon of the black hole, which is much bigger. <laughs> um, so that that entropy, therefore, it should be viewed as some kind of thermodynamic entropy because it increased. Uh, and then there is this other formula for the entropy, which is the essentially this Ruta Kanagi formula mm -hmm. um, or, or fine fine grain gravitational entropy formula. And that's a formula which also involves some area. So it, it's some area, but it's not the area of the horizon. It's the area of the minimal area surface inside the geometry. Or more precisely, extrema. But let me just say minima. Yes, so yes. By a little bit. So we we get uh, to the minimal area. So in the case of a star that collapses, mm -hmm. um, the minimal area has zero size. So it's it, it, it's the gravitational contribution is really zero, and okay. the entropy just continues to be the entropy of the star even after the black hole forms, according to this formula. Okay. So so the the yeah so the 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 crucial point about this new formula is that it uh, well first of all it allows you to compute this von neumann entropy mm -hmm. and the result depends on the geometry in the interior of black holes so it's a uh, it, it's uh, sensitive to what goes on in the interior so if you if you somehow remain outside you have only a purely let's say thermodynamic uh, description coarse grain description which doesn't know all the details mm -hmm. um but if you allow yourself to go into the interior and explore the geometry in the interior, uh, then you know more about, um, you know, this fine grain entropy. Uh, let me let me see if I can um, restate it and please yes. tell me if I'm wrong. But this new perspective, which is kind of generalizes what we said for the area of the black hole, uh, says that when we, because for someone listening, it might be weird to think that uh, the the minimal uh, surface might be a non-trivial one, right? So you take a surface, literally a surface, and you try to look at the deformation of the surface that gives you the minimal area of the surface, which in flat space time, in flat space is just shrinking to zero. Then. Yeah, yeah. That's all yours. While in a, in another geometry, it might be that the minimal area is given by a weird surface uh, distribution. Right. The, in the in the geometry like this is the kind of intuition while for the yeah. case of the star collapse into a black and then you say that the von neumann entropy is equal or given by something proportional to the area of such surface right. Right. in the case of the star you're saying that thing all exactly as in flat space time case namely that the minimal surface is really the one that shrinks to zero right mm -hmm. is this right. the kind of thing you were saying before right yeah that's right that's right and um yeah, so a, a geometry where the minimal surface is non-zero is the so-called two-sided uh, Schwarzschild black hole, which mm -hmm. uh, is a bit like a wormhole where th there is um, there are two black holes connected by some geometry, and in that case, the the minimal area is non-zero. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. So that's a situation where, in fact, the von Neumann entropy is equal to the to the area of the horizon. Okay. Sure. So that's a case when they, they when they are equal. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. okay. and, um, but that, that case does not arise from gravitational collapse, so it's a kind of mm -hmm. uh, artificial configuration. Mm -hmm. uh, now, now, so th this this development of the Rita Kanagi formula and so on was helpful to understand the structure of the of holography, understand uh, sort of some aspect conceptual aspects of how information, quantum information, is stored in the bulk theory. The, the the interesting aspect about this formula is that it translates some geometric aspect uh, like these areas mm -hmm. uh, to a concept that involves quantum information, which is the von Neumann entropy. It, it, it is conceptually saying that um, the geometry of the bulk mm -hmm. encodes the patterns of how quantum information is stored in the system. Yeah, go. I just wanted to 
to ask you to make a bit more clear this connection or broad this connection between quantum information and von Neumann entropy. Like, how does quantum information come into play in this picture, in this yes, yes, yes. correspondence? Yeah, so, okay. So, it's just simply the statement that von Neumann entropy is a is quantum information concept because it's okay. entropy is information. Um, <laughs> it's a measure of the amount of information you somehow lack in the system. So... So if you have some system, if you if you know it completely, then you have zero von Neumann entropy. <laughs> if uh, the system is not in a pure state and is some some kind of mixed state, uh, then uh, it will have a non-zero von Neumann entropy. Okay. So okay. Th th that so it's it's a quantum information concept. Now, in in quantum systems, it's interesting that there can be entanglement. So you might have a full system might have zero entropy. But if you only consider a part of the system, then it will have a non-zero form of Neumann entropy. Mm -hmm. And what that tells you is that uh, you have uh, entanglement in the system and the you know, quantum information is somehow shared uh, within the full system. So to have the full information out of the system, you have to have the whole thing. You have a portion, you, you don't have the full information. And so that means that part of the information is uh, spread uh, through entanglement am among the parts that make the system. Okay. Okay. It, it, it's for this, yeah. So the geometry of the bulk encodes how that quantum information is spread uh, in the system. Mm -hmm. uh, so when you say that when you have a system with in which you only consider a subsystem, can we say that yeah. the fact that maybe, okay, the full system, if you know precisely everything, von Neumann entropy is zero, if you only consider a subsystem and only look at that. Uh, you can have non-zero von Neumann entropy because you yes, have yes. entanglement between the two. Yes. Does this mean that these entropy measures are lack of knowledge on the other part of the system? Can this be? Yeah, yeah, you can say that. So the, the simplest example of this are two spins uh, that okay. are entangled with each other. So they, when they're entangled, they are in some quantum system. Uh, if you have access to maybe only one, if they're maximally entangled, if you have access to, to only one, then that entropy will be maximal, so you have complete ignorance. Okay, okay. It was just to to make things, uh, yes. uh, right, to, to be absolutely sure about what you were saying. Okay, so, and from this uh, Ryu Takayanagi, Takayanagi formula, how things did develop, right? What happened uh, next? Yeah, so so that, that was uh, very influential for understanding the structure of uh, holography, and um, then, then something that was important that at the time, was just simply a correction. Was that this formula has a correction that the full formula? Uh, well, in fact, is something that is true also. So for black hole formula, for the black hole formula, the the full formula is the area plus the entropy outside. So we have to add the entropy outside mm -hmm. the black hole to have the full entropy outside. So it's the area plus sure. uh, the entropy of quantum fields and. Be so that there could be some entropy outside the black hole. And similarly for the, the von Neumann entropy, um, there there could be some entropy outside this this area. Mm -hmm. um, so in fact, uh, when we discussed the star example, I implicitly used that because we said that the, the entropy in that case is equal to the, the area is zero, but the entropy is still the entropy of the star. So, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. and now, then, then in the in, in 2019, there was uh, the realization that th this correction actually becomes very important in the case of a black hole that is uh, has been evaporating for a long time, uh, okay. and uh, mm -hmm. yeah, that was uh, work by Jeff Bennington, Almeri Engelhardt, uh, Marov van Maxville. Um, so, so when the black hole has evaporated for a long time. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, b before I discuss that, let me just make a, a simpler point mm -hmm. uh, related to this to, to, to this entropy outside. So the, this this fact that the entropy should include the area plus the entropy outside is important for the second law of thermodynamics for just ordinary black holes. And um, so because when the black hole evaporates, the mass decreases and then the area of the horizon decreases. So if the entropy was just the area, it would be decreasing, which co would contradict the second law of thermodynamics. So as you said before, uh, just to be so before you mentioned the fact that black holes have a temperature and they are like thermodynamical objects, 
that yes, yes. evaporations come the evaporation comes precisely from the fact that black holes have a temperature so they radiate yeah, indeed, so yeah. they must lose mass and shrink right this is the kind of thing right, right, you're right, thinking about. Right, okay right. yeah so you have a situation where that uh, radiation can go very far away and then the the black hole can start losing energy then um it will lose mass and the area will shrink um but if you calculate the entropy of the Hawking radiation and you add it to the area, then you get something which is bigger than the original area. So this whole process uh, actually increases entropy, um, the process of Hawking radiation. And so this shows that it is important to have the area plus the entropy of those uh, fields outside or the particles that are, are outside the black hole. And only when you consider everything, you have the standard thermodynamic loss. So, um, so that's true already for the for the Bekenstein formula, or <laughs> this, through this quantum correction. Um, now, now we go back to uh, the fine grain entropy formula or the quantum version of the Ruth Aganagi formula, which is the area plus the entropy outside. So mm -hmm. we have uh, include that, um, and when we include that for a very old black hole that's been evaporating for a long time, then uh, we have a new feature that can happen. So the, the the idea is the following. So when the black hole is evaporating, so we said that the entropy of the Hawking radiation outside is increasing. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you have, uh, if you consider also the black hole interior, the entropy is not increasing because the Hawking radiation is entangled with the partners of Hawking radiation that are falling into the black hole. So you can think of the process as uh, starting from the vacuum, you have a, one particle goes out and one particle goes inside. So the if you were to consider yes. purely the interior of the black hole, the entropy would also be increasing. Taken mm -hmm. together with the exterior, it's not increasing. Mm -hmm. um, so now if you if you take the black hole and you consider just the region very close to, relatively close to the black hole, so not not including the region very far away where the radiation has gone, um, if it is an old black hole, then the interior will be filled of all these partners of Hawking radiation. So there will be a large contribution to the entropy. And if that, um, so, but that contribution will be included if, we take the same area that we were including when we constructed the star the star entropy. Remember that we took an area which was the minimum and went all the way to uh, the center of the object. That will include all the entropy of the partners. And that entropy might be become bigger than the area itself. Okay? Mm -hmm. And what was discovered in these papers is that when that there is a second uh, surface that uh, is somehow close to the horizon and it's uh, it's minimal once you include the the area the entropy outside, um, and the the area of the surface is close to the area of the horizon. Okay. So in this situation, the one that has minimal area, the the minimum surface is the one that um, that is close to the horizon. So it's just the area of the horizon. So it does not include uh, this whole interior region. And so in that way, um, we so that the presence of the second surface. Ensures mm -hmm. that the entropy of the black hole, you know, that doesn't 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 start growing. It just goes essentially like the areas we would have expected. Um, but it also has some implication for the entropy of the Hawking radiation. So if you exactly right, consider, yeah, if you consider just the Hawking radiation, uh, you should apply the same formula for computing its entropy. Mm -hmm. So, so with, with the Ruta, you should apply the Ruta Kanagi formula. And in that case, it would it would mean that you would mi minimize its entropy by include by considering this this surface that is close to the horizon, and um, and then the entropy of that surface would be equal to the entropy of the black hole. So it will not of of the black hole at that time. So when the black hole evaporates and finishes evaporating, the, that entropy will be very small. Uh, so the entropy of the Hawking radiation then it, it increases in the beginning and then it decreases again. Uh, so which this is what we expect from unitarity. But this is uh, really impressive, if I may, because uh, if I understand, I mean, if the picture I'm uh, I'm giving you is correct, like uh, first of all, black holes shrink, right, when they evaporate. So we expect their total entropy to shrink because 
you know, it's yeah. proportional to the area. But a certain point during the evaporation, some kind of people call it paradox. I guess we can call it problem arises at this point, yeah. right? <laughs> that you you expect a lot of radiation to have fallen into the black hole and the total entropy, like naively, to be larger than that given by the area. Right. 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 So this is this can be a problem, right? Because the area should be the maximum entropy associated to this region, while you 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 seem to have more than that, right? Right. You, you say that using this Ryutaka Yanagi formula, you discover that, ah, but this is wrong because actually there's another surface and you have to consider the minimal one. And if you consider yeah. the correct surface and you minimize that area, you get the correct counting for the entropy, right? The yeah. correct. Okay, is this the, the right picture? Because I yeah, remember that's, that's, that's... those papers came out, it was super interesting. But then what you get, and this is particularly for, for because I can picture the question that might pop up in the mind of someone listening to us. So you said that in some sense, the entropy of the radiation grows and then decreases, right? As you measure it, as the black hole shrinks, as this right. thing happens. People usually expect no, so, because naively, like intuitively, this seems to correspond, and I'm asking you why this is wrong or how this is imprecise, but this might seem like some kind of something getting out of the black hole, right? Purifying this radiation or some kind of information getting out of the black hole. Because if you said that, like, entropy measures the our lack of knowledge on the interior of the black hole, if this entropy decreases, seems like we are learning something about the inside of the black hole, right? How does this match with the standard intuition that black holes should not allow anything to get out? Does this violate it or is this, can this be reconciled with the standard picture? Um, is this just an apparent paradox, right? Or well, well, I mean, yeah. So th this formula is is um, similar in spirit to the Bekenstein formula in the sense that it gives you the entropy, mm -hmm. but does not tell you exactly where the microstates are. So okay. I, I think what you when when you ask the question, you have you had in mind uh, exactly how you know what. It, yeah. you, you implicitly assume that you, we could keep track of all the black hole microstates and okay. and see see how the information is coming out. We, we don't we don't understand that yet. So okay, all, all we can do is that we have a kind of uh, if you wish microscopic formula that computes the von Neumann entropy, <laughs> which depends on the geometry of space time, and that those computations are compatible with the idea that information is coming out. Okay. But, the details of how it comes out is not uh, is not understood from from the gravity picture. Perfect. So, but in this sense, we uh, it is correct to state that the intuition, at least that this formula provides us with, is that when you go to the quantum level, there must be some mechanism that takes information, whatever that is, right takes information out of the black hole, which is something that in standard general relativity should not happen. So this would be some kind of important deviation due to quantum effects, right? Is it something like yeah, that? Yeah, yeah. It's, it's important that uh, both for justifying this formula and for understanding a little bit how this information could come out, you have to consider space-time configurations that are have a non-trivial topology where mm -hmm. there are wormholes and so on. So <laughs> imagine that you were trying to to, to, to check that uh, the state that comes out of Hawking radiation is pure, right? Mm -hmm. So then there is in quantum information, there is something called the swap, the, the swap test, which is something you could do to check whether a state is pure or not without knowing its particular state. Okay. So if you were to do this in this case, the important thing is that you can um, connect the black hole interiors in two different ways. Uh, through wormholes and so on. So that's uh, how okay. Um, how, okay. how that swaps this would work. So at a quantum level, there should be some corrections precisely coming from considering other space-time topologies, other solutions, other, like from, this is the kind yes, of... Yes, yes, should yes. So, so it was crucial to include this other space-time topologies. So right. one of the recent, uh, yeah, developments is to... Uh, so the understanding that the space-time topologies lead to a bunch of interesting effects um, okay. are important for things related to the information paradox. 
So, and concerning all this discussion, because we um, we mentioned a lot of um, honestly incredible results that came out of this line of research, but how much of this, because this is also something which might not be clear to a student, or at least was not clear to me when I was trying to approach the subject, how much of this relies on either string theory or supersymmetry, and what is instead like considered as being independent from it, like did yeah, it yeah, yeah. So this, this last part, this last part where we talked about the Rutak and Nagy formula and the entropy of Hawking radiation and so on, that that does not rely on supersymmetry or string theory. It's supposed okay. to be valued in the general theory of gravity, okay. and it's something that could have been done, uh, you know, by the people who did. In, in principle, just knowing only uh, the Euclidean methods for black hole thermodynamics. Um, okay. Gibbons and Hawking and so on. Uh, it, it could, in principle, be justified in that way. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it was one of these other examples where um, knowing holography and these examples from string theory led to people led people thinking in this direction. Mm -hmm. um, and then in the end, the final result could be applied without uh, any reference to to these okay. particular examples. Um, now, the, the, the examples are useful because there are some... Con this is, in those examples, you could define precisely in principle all these entropies. <laughs> in, uh, in general, you might have doubts that maybe you don't know what you're talking about. Or, <laughs> but, uh, so this gives some context where all these entropies are well defined. Um, but but yeah, so the, the development is, is independent of that. And that's what one would hope. I mean, one would hope that uh, we understand better quantum gravity and how to deal with quantum gravity in, in situations where we don't have perhaps these correspondences, like uh, perhaps in cosmology. Mm -hmm. so, so far, there hasn't been any interesting application of these ideas to cosmology. Okay. But, um, but hopefully that might come. Like, okay, so thank you very much for, for the answer. Uh, so let, let me just ask you a few questions just to, to make some things clear, which are sometimes might be even just dumb questions, but are often like uh, a discussion theme among students that might not get some points. So uh, in general, what are expectations on holography applied to general kinds of space times? Like, do people expect any space time to be holographic to something, right? Any solution to Einstein field equations would meet some dual boundary dual even like you know flat space time some boundary at infinity or right. positive cosmological constant you know stuff like that or are things still highly speculative in that sense or to what degree things are speculative or certain not to to be or not to be possible well i think nowadays we we only understand holography for cases that are either anti-deceiter or closely related to Okay. I mean, the curvature could, could vary slowly, but it's essentially negative. Mm -hmm. um, and we, we we don't know how holography works in flat space or in, uh, in, 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 in... Well, actually, in flat space, we, we do have a sort of alternative description or a matrix, so some quantum mechanical description. Uh, for the S matrix. So in flat space, the observables uh, are supposed to be the S matrix. And in in, in highly supersymmetric situations, uh, thanks to the work of Bank, uh, Fischler, Saskin, and Schenker, we um, have uh, a, a description. Um, and yeah, so we don't know. So we, we you could imagine a description of that kind in general. Um, so I would say we have some version of uh, flat space holography. Um, it's a description that breaks some of the symmetries explicitly. So you have to choose a like on direction and so on. Um, and so people are exploring now some other possible descriptions, perhaps where you don't break uh, those symmetries. Um, but it hasn't been found yet. So the, the only one we have is that one. So I would say it's somewhat similar in spirit to the ADS uh, situation. Uh, mm -hmm. In the sense that we have, in some very special cases, some some way to compute it exactly. So, if you had a powerful enough computer, you could quantum computer, you could calculate the S matrix in eleven dimensions and so on. Um, 
Now for the sitter, it's uh, harder. So the sitter is the most interesting case because that's uh, the case of the expanding universe. Our universe is closer to the sitter than to any of these other cases. And um, and it's also a universe that could, in principle, have some initial singularity. Um, and that's something we would like to understand. And there you might, but by analogy with the ADS situation, you might think that perhaps there is some theory in the future that uh, that is relevant. Uh, but uh, is, we, we don't have any example. Okay, okay. There are other ideas of how the sitter holography could work. So if, if you think about an observer inside the sitter space, uh, there is a cosmological horizon. So you may think mm -hmm. that there might be some theory that lives at the cosmological horizon. Uh, that would have finite area, so that that's an alternative uh, version that's sometimes called the static patch holography. But um, again, we we don't have examples. So okay, well, possible theories of this kind. But it, it might, the, the thing is that in the ADS and flat space cases, we were held by supersymmetry, in mm -hmm. the sense that there are supersymmetric theories, um, and in those cases, you can find examples thanks to techniques of supersymmetry. But in in the sitter, the sitter is not compatible with supersymmetry. So we don't have supersymmetric examples. Mm -hmm. And it might be that such dualities are true and uh, but we, we don't have the techniques to study them today. So oh. perhaps in the future when we have better techniques, we you know maybe yeah I, I don't know whether those techniques will be analytic or maybe through some quantum computer simulations or whatever, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll find some examples. Okay, okay. Well, uh, thank you. And just la two last questions, very, a bit more personal and a bit more relaxed. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for all the long discussion and probably we touched a lot of distinct topics. And in that sense, uh, it might be interesting to ask you what are the future perspectives you see for the field, like uh, what would be something reasonable to expect to happen or something you'd like to see happening or something that might be happening in the near future? Clearly, I, I, I see that this is, I mean, I don't want you, I don't want to ask you to predict the future otherwise, <laughs> no, but something general about future perspectives in this context. Well, I, I think the most interesting problem in quantum gravity is to understand the beginning of the universe. Um, I, I think that's clearly the most interesting problem, and that's the main reason I think to study quantum gravity. Um, now, the beginning of the universe had a cosmological cosmological singularity. I'm talking not about the beginning of the Big Bang, but perhaps what there was inflation and well, some something that came before inflation. Um, so if you extrapolate backwards, you expect the singularity. Um, and now in the case of black holes, uh, we also have a, well, in the case of cosmology it would be wonderful to understand it directly. We, um, but yeah, and, and that's clearly the most interesting problem. The case of black holes uh, looks a little simpler. And the, the black hole, if you look at it from the outside, it, uh, you know, you can sit far away where the universe is not expanding or contracting. You have some kind of a firm footing where you can ask uh, precise questions and this black hole information problem questions are, are of that kind. Mm -hmm. But one would like to, um, one would like to understand the black hole interior better. So, and given that we understand better the exterior, we would hope to understand the interior better. And in particular, the black hole singularity. Okay. And um, we don't understand it yet, but the hope is that by understanding the black hole singularity better, we might learn some lessons about the cosmological singularity, which is the most important problem. So I think in the near future, it might be possible to understand the black hole singularity. Okay. So by uh, applying these kind of techniques and uh, approaches. Yeah, so some of these techniques and approaches might, might lead to some ideas about how to think about the singularity and how to mm -hmm. resolve it. I mean, in some, in some sense, the singularity means that with the current theories of general relativity plus, you know, standard quantum field theory, we, we don't know what to do with it. Mm -hmm. no. Even in uh, theories like string theory and so on, which uh, work nicely in flat, small perturbations around flat space, we don't know 
uh, what happens at the black hole singularity. So it's really something that we should understand. Like yeah. either resolve it uh, or substitute it with something of quantum gravitational nature or yeah 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 what happens there does time cease to make sense and in what sense <laughs> does it stop making sense is there a bounce is there a second universe inside is there you know there are these questions which uh, currently we can't answer we don't know the answer okay and um, like Okay, so given that you brought the thing to, which is what I expected and desired, actually, uh, the question to big open issues in uh, theoretical physics, like what happened at the beginning of the universe or at the center, what happens at the center of a black hole, does time cease to make sense and so on and so forth. May I, in order to close our interview, ask you, uh, which might have something to do with such questions, questions it usually does, what... Uh, and I'm sorry if this is too personal, but what led you into, into this kind of field? This can be really helpful for students at the beginning. So how did you personally get into this kind of topics, into this kind of research, into theoretical physics, but more precisely quantum gravity and these kind of issues? How, I mean, what, uh, what was your you know, fuel in order to get to this point? Um, well, when I started physics, I didn't know what I was going to do. I okay. certainly liked physics, I liked mathematics, and um, then I, I, in general, within physics, I kind of veered towards a little more mathematical topics, <laughs> uh, and um, yeah, quantum field theory, particle physics, and so on, and uh, this problem of quantum gravity sounded like an interesting problem where uh, you could mixed general relativity and quantum field theory and yeah so that, that's when i was already an undergraduate in argentina i started sort of thinking a bit in this direction and then then i kind of continued <laughs> oh, okay I, continued okay. I think it's uh you know it's an interesting direction it um i mean it's definitely the questions are definitely very interesting the but this field has an issue, which is that we cannot do experiments. And that's, uh, I guess that's the main drawback. So the main thing that is interesting is that the questions are super interesting. The The main drawback is that we cannot do experiments. At least uh, we haven't found a way to, 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 do, to do experiments. Um, I mean, well, for, for holography, might be able, one might be able to do experiments in the sense that one could simulate quantum systems uh, in a simulator and, and then see well see that they behave like uh, you know like universes described by gravity and and so one could check some of the examples but that's perhaps not the most interesting thing the most interesting thing might be that by by with these quantum computers one might discover new examples that have nothing to do with supersymmetry might okay. uh, and uh, yeah and then at least uh, we, we might be able to learn what what it takes to make a universe that uh, is described by Einstein gravity. Well, on this hopeful, I get, <laughs> I would say, sentence like, let's hope there's something hidden there for us to discover in the near future, something we'll see. I want to once again, thank you very much for your time, your patience and your help today. I, I'm sure our audience appreciated your uh, interview a lot so and i thank you on, both on behalf of the of the society and on behalf of myself and my colleagues let me say that sure it was a pleasure yeah. thank you very much okay thank you yeah.